I would invite you to open your Bibles this morning to the book of Psalms, chapter 118. Psalm 118. Last Sunday morning, we looked at one of the Psalms in the Bible that's not found in the book of Psalms, but rather in the book of First Chronicles. Today, we'll be looking at Psalm 118, verses 8 and 9. Our message is entitled, I Think I'm Sure. I Think I'm Sure. Psalm 118, verse 8, when you find that in your copy of God's Word, I would invite you out of reverence to God's Word to bow your head with me this morning. And before we read God's Word this morning, I invite you to bow your heart before God as well. And take the next few moments of quiet meditation and invite God to speak to your heart this morning. Take a few moments in silent meditation, then I'll lead us in a word of prayer and read our text. Heavenly Father, I am grateful that there is power in the name of Jesus Christ, power to break every chain power to break the chain of sin in our lives. And I am grateful that on one evening you broke that sin chain in my life and forgave me. And I am grateful for the standing that I have before you. Thank you for the opportunity to proclaim your word this morning. Father, I pray that we hear from you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Two verses this morning, Psalm 118, verses 8 and 9. The Bible says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in leaders. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. The story is told of a courtroom scene one day as the judge has been seated and called the court to order. The prosecuting attorney, the defense attorney were there present. The prosecuting attorney stood up and he called his very first witness to the stand, a sweet grandmotherly elderly woman. He called her to the stage and he approached her and he said, Mrs. Jones, do you know me? She responded, why yes, I know you, Mr. Williams. I've known you since you were a young boy. And frankly, you've been a big disappointment to me. You lie, cheat on your wife, you manipulate people and talk about them behind their backs. You think you're a rising big shot lawyer, but you haven't got the brains to realize that you'll never amount to anything more than a two-bit paper pusher. Yes, I know you. Stunned, the prosecuting attorney had no idea what to do. He simply looked at the defense attorney and he said, Mrs. Jones, do you know the defense attorney? And she said, why, yes, I do. I've known Mr. Bradley since he was a youngster. I even babysat him for his parents. And he, too, has been a real disappointment to me. He's lazy, bigoted, and he has a drinking problem. He can't build a normal relationship with anyone, and his law practice is one of the shoddiest in the area. Yes, I know him. Well, at that point, the judge had to gavel the courtroom out of the chaos it had turned into, and he called the defense attorney and the prosecuting attorney to the bench, and in a very menacingly voice, he said to them, if either of you ask that woman if she knows me, I'll throw you in jail. 
Now, I don't know what kind of relationship you might have if you had to go before the judge. But I can tell you that the Bible is absolutely clear when it says, one day you will not stand before a judge. You will stand before the judge. One day every one of us will stand before God and give an account of our lives. So the question today is, what is your relationship with the judge? I want us to look at these two verses this morning. I want to share just three simple promises with you, three simple promises principles with you this morning. I hope that you'll jot them down. I hope you'll spend some time thinking and meditating on them this week. First of all, I want us to notice that he is my rock, he is my promise, and he is my reminder and responsibility. He is my rock. How many here have ever been in the courtroom? I didn't ask if you were before the court, I just asked if you'd been in the courtroom. All right. I don't know if you've ever had to stand in front of the judge or not, but one day you will. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 31, the Bible says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hand of an angry God. I love what Romans 7 says, Blessed are they whose sins are forgiven and covered. Blessed are they whose sins the Lord will never count against them. One of the most awesome things I know about my relationship with the judge is that my sins are forgiven and covered. And because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross of Calvary for me, I will be able to stand before the judge and know with certainty what my relationship with him is. Because the Bible says the only way you can have a relationship with God is to come through his son, Jesus Christ. And if you are willing, one, the Bible says, to forgive or to ask God to forgive your sins, you are willing to tell God you're sorry for your sins, and two, trust his son, Jesus Christ, as the only way to heaven. God will forgive your sin, all of it. No matter where you've been, what you've done in life, God will forgive your sin, cleanse your heart, adopt you as his child. And it is only through that moment of salvation that you and I have a standing before God, have a relationship with God, and will be confident in standing before the judge. I honestly believe that there is no more profound or important truth in all of the world than what your relationship is with the judge. And you can be confident. In fact, I love what the Bible says. These things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. It is the, one of the most incredible things I ever found out about God, that I could know that I have eternal life. It's not because of how I feel. It's not because of what I have done. It's not even for the potential that you or I might have. It is based entirely on what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for me. And that relationship with God is for you if you're willing to accept it. He is my rock. It is better to trust in God than to put your confidence in others. He's also my reminder. I love this point. And, and uh, I was looking at this and being, being uh, remindful of what God really is to me. And I find that that relationship that him and I have comes primarily through prayer. You know, it's awesome that we have an opportunity to pray to God. Our Bible study time this morning in 1 Peter chapter 2 that told us we are living stones. That metaphor that we are the stones and Christ is the cornerstone and we are built off of that. That we are a royal and a holy priesthood. 
that I can have access to God is absolutely amazing. It is one of the first things that I came to grips with understanding who God is, that I have access to God, that I don't have to go through someone else. People often tease, well, you're the pastor, you got the red phone in your office that goes like straight there to heaven. You know what? I don't have any better connection to God than you as a child of God do. Isn't that awesome? We have access to God. It's in that daily prayer time that we have. Two weeks ago, I was reading these verses in my personal devotions, and it's how God began to speak to my heart about this message today, my daily time with him. That time in prayer throughout the day. In July, my wife and I will celebrate 38 years of marriage. She is to be commended for that. I didn't need quite that many amens for that point. It's amazing how things I think you should amen, you don't, and things I hope you won't, you will. You may not know that in our relationship, for me it was love at first sight, and for her it was not. It, okay, I was a little more attractive then than I was now. And it took a long time for me to convince her to even go out with me. And when she did, and we began to date, the first year and a half, in fact, most all of our dating relationship occurred long distance. I was away in Bible college in Virginia, and she lived in Florida. Back then, we had pay telephones. It's a box that hangs on a wall. It has dials on it. Um, we had pay tele telephones. And we had one inside the dorm for about 40 guys. And it would finally come my opportunity. And because I didn't usually have any money and enough change, I would have to bill it to the home phone of my dad's house. And his rules were pretty simple. You can call her a couple of times a week on my dime. And so we would call and talk on the telephone. That's all we had. We would write letters. For the year and a half that I was in college, I wrote her a letter every single day. She will tell you only three days out of a year and a half that I did not write her a letter every day and we'd call a couple of times and talk on the phone and it was glorious and you know the problem with that was it was great because that's all we had but I can tell you that if somebody would have said you're going to continue to live the rest of your life in Virginia she's going to continue to live the rest of her life in Florida and I think you ought to get married Why would I want to marry somebody that I wasn't going to be able to spend time with? You see, calling was great. Getting letters was great. But it's not the kind of real relationship that we wanted to have the rest of our lives. It was, I want to be with you. You want to be with me. Isn't it a shame that most of us, for most of our Christian life, are content with a long-distance relationship with God? That if we talk every once in a while, and I go to church every once in a while, that we're fine with that? That's not the kind of relationship I wanted to have with Pala. I wanted to be with her. I wanted to spend time with her. I wanted us to grow in our love. <coughs> and yet, we often find ourselves content with that long-distance kind of relationship with God.
I told you she didn't fall in love with me quite as quickly as I did. And I would over and over profess my love to her. And she would sign her name. Have a good day, pal. <laughs> and one time, she sent me a letter and said, I just want to be friends. <sighs> really? And I could have responded and said, I'm good with that. <laughs> we'll just be friends. Uh-uh. <laughs> I didn't want to be just friends with her. And of course, our relationship developed. and We got married, and we get to spend all the time together, and it's wonderful. I wouldn't be satisfied with a long-distance relationship with her. And I don't want to be satisfied with having a long-distance relationship with God either. And there's something else you need to know. I thought of it this week. You know, I was the one who really pursued that relationship very hard at first. And when I think about my relationship with God, as much as I love him, he's the one who pursued me. He's the one who loves me more. How could I not want to develop that relationship with God in such a way that we're together all the time? See, that's my prayer time. It's my reminder of my relationship with God. There are a lot of other things, but just for that second point today, just understand. He's not only my rock, and I have confidence in how I will stand before him one day, but the kind of relationship that I desire with God is the kind of relationship where we spend time together all the time. And that relationship grows. And I love him more and more and more all the time. That I'm never satisfied with where it is. My daily reminder is my prayer time with God. It is that that reminds me of the confidence that I have in him of who I am with the judge. I can not only stand before God and say, as the judge, I am confident in my standing with you, but judge, <laughs> you also know that you and I love to spend time together. Then the last thing I want us to re be reminded by is our responsibility in it. And our responsibility is obedience. My responsibility is obedience. It's really a great segue when you think about it because most of us like to pray and most of us want to pray, but often our prayer life doesn't really develop any more than long distance. Most of us want to be obedient to God, but the degree to which we are obedient to God is sometimes called in to question. In 1 John chapter 3, when it speaks about prayer and obedience going together, it reminds us that we receive what we ask when we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. See, we have this kind of false conception in Christianity today where we can live our lives any way we want to and then turn around and ask God to give us a blessing. Think about that in your relationship with your spouse or your children or your friends or your coworkers, That's not going to work in those relationships, is it? I can treat you any way I want to, then turn around and ask you for something. You know what that is? That's a teenager. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. Yeah, it can be a teenager. I get to treat you any way I want to, then turn around and ask you for something. It shouldn't be that way in our relationships, yet we think it's okay with God. We ask God to bless our finances, but we're not obedient to him in it. 
It's amazing. I saw one thing the other day, and it showed this video. I was kind of hoping I could show it in church, but it showed this video of this family on their way to church, and they're in the church, and the dad's complaining about things. The mom is arguing with the children about things. The kids are all back there gossiping about everybody that's in church. They pull in the church parking lot, and dad goes, shh, we're at church. Like, we can just shut all the stuff off that's in our minds, step in the doors and go, I love you, God. Why are we content with that? What would give us the even inkling in our mind that we can live our life any way we want to during the week and then come to church and say, God, I love you, bless me. It's not the kind of relationship that God desires to have with you and I. It's not the kind of relationship that God wants with us or we want with God. I love what Oswald Chambers said. By the way, if you're looking for a devotion book and you really want to get deep into devotions, get Oswald Chambers. Anybody, how many here read Oswald Chambers? Some do, don't get Oswald Chambers if you want to just read a light devotion and go to bed. If you want to think, great devotion book. Anyway, he writes, the best measure of spirituality is obedience. Puts it as simple as it can be. The best measure of spirituality is obedience. Psalm 66 puts it in a way we don't really like. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord does not hear me. Ugh, I don't like that verse. I don't really like it. If I regard iniquity in my heart, God does not hear me. The spiritual principle there for you and I to realize is what we've been talking about this morning, that we can't just live our life any way we want, then turn around and say, God, I need you. We regard iniquity in our heart. Do we really believe what verse 8 says, that it's better to trust in the Lord than to put our confidence in other people? Well, we're in church, so we'll say that. Oh, I believe that because the Bible says it and I'm in church. But yet the reality of it is, why do we go and ask other people for advice before we go to ask God? Why are we often more interested in what other people think about us than what God thinks about us? I have struggled with that all of my life. I'm being open with you. We get more concerned about what other people think of us than what God thinks of us. We can even do that in church, can't we? We can become more concerned about what other people think than what God thinks. We talked about it in worship last Sunday morning. Are we really more concerned? Is our trust really in God more than it is in others? In his book entitled, God is With Me. Walter Swanson uh, writes the biography about a man named Robert Dollar, not the dollar of dollar store, but Robert Dollar. Robert Dollar was a sea captain. He was also a believer. He believed that his life with God was the most important thing that was part of him. He began as a sea captain traveling around the world. He began to build a business and businesses globally. The author tells in the story in his book there that at one point the keen-eyed captain found himself in the lobby of a very large hotel in Hong Kong. He met another businessman there who was from Hong Kong and was also into the global market. And that particular businessman said, so I see you've come to open a business in the Orient. And he replied, yes, I have. And he said, why don't you come into the bar and tell me all about your plans? To which Robert Dollar said, I'm sorry, I don't touch the stuff. The other businessman said, uh, if you don't mind me saying, um, if you're going to do business in the Orient and not drink, God help you. And Robert Dollar responded to him and said, I believe he will. 
Years later, Robert Dollar found himself on the 10th floor of a large office building in San Francisco that bore his name. Looking out on the harbor at his fleet of ships and watching countless men unload off of his fleet of ships. He was reminded of that day in that lobby of that hotel where he simply made the statement and had the principle that I'm going to be obedient to God. In fact, he would go on to say, obedience is in the detail. Is that true of you and I? Do we live our life any way we want to? Do we put our trust in what other people say? Do we follow a business plan? A peer plan? A family plan? Rather than put our faith and trust in God? Are we content with a long distance relationship? Or is spending time with God something that really puts us in a I want to do that mode? You see, the Bible says there's a big difference between religion and relationship. It's, it's, it's just amazing. In fact, when you think about all of the religions in the world, the uniqueness of Christianity, and the one thing that sets it apart, is that in religion you are doing your best to earn your way to a standing with God, and in Christianity, God does all of the work in Christ coming to earth to die on a cross so that you could have a relationship with God. That's awesome. It's what separates it from all other religions in the world. You see, God doesn't want you to have religion. Yeah, you heard it in church today. God does not want you to have religion. God wants a relationship. And he doesn't want a long-distance relationship with you. He wants a close, intimate relationship. You know, there is a difference between religion and relationship. <clears throat> Reminded of the um, somewhat cantankerous um, person who said that, uh, my life has changed now that I got religion. And the pastor of the church said, Religion? She said, oh, yeah, I got religion. He said, really, tell me about it. She said, well, I used to have an uncle that I hated so much that I vowed I'd never even go to his funeral. But now I got religion, and I'll be glad to go to his funeral. It'll sink in in a little bit. And so that's religion. It's not relationship. Your relationship with God comes just as 1 Peter 2 said this morning. He is the cornerstone. And he is either the foundation that you place your life and eternity on, or he is, as Peter said, the stumbling block that you reject and causes you to fall. Your choice is to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, to ask God to save you, or your choice to say, it's not what I want. But the Bible does say, Jesus' own words, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father unless they come through me. The simple truth of it is you can put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. In a moment, we're going to have an invitation and invite folks to come and pray at the front of our church. If you're not sure about your relationship with God, you can be. We'd love to take a few minutes and talk to you before you go today. Just sit down, open God's word simply and say, here's what God wants. Here's your part. And you can leave this place today knowing that you're a child of God. To my brother, sister in Christ, I, I, I just ask you today, don't be settled for a long-distance relationship. Don't settle for it.
Make a commitment today that says, God, I want to know you deeper. I want to love you more. I want to love you more than the day I put my faith and trust in you. In your prayer life. God, I want my prayer life to be powerful, to be a reminder of my relationship with you. God, I don't want religion. I want a relationship. And God, I don't want to obey you in most things. I want to obey you in everything. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me this morning? Heads bowed. With your heads bowed today, if you're not sure about your relationship with God, we'd love to talk to you about it today. In a moment, we have our invitation. I just invite you to walk right down here to the front. I'll be standing right down here and just let me know, Pastor, I'd like to settle my relationship with God today. And we'll have someone sit down and pray with you about that this morning. To my brother, sister in Christ, I'd invite you to come to the altar this morning. To begin, to begin a life-changing moment. God, I want to know you better. I want to love you better. God, I don't want a long-distance relationship. I want an intimate relationship. And I'd invite you as a, as a believer to come to the altar this morning just between you and God. Maybe to come and say, God, I haven't been obedient. God, I need to be obedient. I need to be that living sacrifice. Maybe there's something else that you want to come and pray about this morning. Maybe to come and pray for somebody. A lot of folks sick. Death angel visited our community a number of times this week. Maybe there's somebody you'd like to come and pray about. You know our altar's open for that. Whether you sit, stand, kneel, make it your altar this morning. Father, I pray that you'd bless our invitation time. I pray that we'd be willing to be obedient. In Jesus' name we pray. I'm going to ask you to stand with your heads bowed this morning.